Welcome to today's webinar, All About Trees, presented by Dr. Greg Moore. Dr. Moore is a Senior Research Associate at the University of Melbourne at the Burnley campus. Greg is a botanist and plant mechanic with a specific interest in the scientific study of the cultivation and management of trees. Greg's passion for trees is centered around understanding how trees cope with their environment and appreciating the benefits trees provide in urban spaces. We are so very lucky to have him available to share his expertise with us today. But before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're meeting from today and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I also extend my respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are with us today. I'll now hand you across to Dr Moore. Thanks, Greg. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be here and to have the chance to talk to all of those people associated with the uh, Sun Smart message. And I just want to begin by setting the scene for what's about to come. Uh, many of us would regard that uh, our cities and towns are fairly green and leafy, but in fact, that's not the case. The tree cover of most cities and towns is by no means as dense as people think or perhaps wish. Uh, for example, London calls itself uh, a forest, a city in a forest, uh, and its canopy cover is about 25%. Uh, over half of the local government agencies, agencies in Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide and Perth have canopy covers well under 20%. And the truth of the matter is, we're losing that canopy cover at a rate of about 1% to 1.5% per annum. So, that's the scene, that's the situation we, we're in at the present time. It's not just about um, adding more canopy cover, it's about managing what we've got and retaining it because that canopy cover is going to be really important in the future, particularly as climate changes. There are many, many benefits from the presence of uh, green space and true green space in particular. And the information on these benefits is so much that someone like me who 15 years ago could probably uh, talk about most of the benefits um, in a list of about a dozen or so would find it very difficult to keep up to date today. Uh, there are just so many publications, so many scientific papers, and many of them are from other disciplines. Um, the obvious ones, of course, are recreation, uh, planning and so on. But the number of uh, publications in the medical journals that relate to the value of trees is really quite extraordinary. And uh, I certainly admit to not being able to keep up with that aspect of things any longer. Uh, while we're talking about trees and um, in, in cities and towns in particular, um, I know that some of you will be looking for some take home messages from this, things that you can sort of store in your, uh, in your brain uh, and use conveniently with others. And one of the messages that I'd like you to take is to think about 30% uh, uh, as an arboricultural magic number. And so just to give you an example of why I think it's a bit of a magic number, uh, in Australia, if you've got 30% canopy cover, you have a forest. That's the official sort of definition of a forest. If you've got trees that provide canopy cover of 30% of the ground underneath them, that's a forest. Uh, to maximise the benefits of urban trees, uh, the benefits go up quite dramatically until you get to about 30%. And then the law of diminish re diminishing returns comes in. And after that, you've got to do an awful lot of work for a relatively small benefit. So we're aiming, if we can, to get about a 30% canopy cover. And people, Australians, when they're buying a property, the property value goes up when the trees on the property uh, go up to about 30%. And then when you get to 30%, the value starts to drop. So Australians want trees on their properties, but they don't want too many. And so overall, there's a pretty good reason for looking at 30% in terms of what the canopy cover should be in suburbs, towns, and cities of Australia. That's our aspiration. And as I've mentioned already, we're a long way from it. Now, although data are hard to come by, um, we know that in many places, Melbourne, Adelaide, we know for sure, uh, parts of Sydney, about one to one and a half percent of the canopy cover is being lost. Now, most of this canopy cover that's lost 
is from private open space. And by private open space, I mean front and backyards. And almost everyone who's listening to this will automatically be thinking, ah, that's from the redevelopment of larger blocks for townhouses and the like. And that's exactly what's happening. Uh, and in terms of tree removal, uh, about 95% of the tree removal requests across, across Australia, and it's the same in Victoria, are ultimately approved. Uh, so lots of people think, oh, you can't take trees out, but the data says otherwise, because you may not get to remove the tree the first time you ask, but the second, third or fourth, it will normally mean that it's gone. Now, what I'm also suggesting here is that trees are so important that if we keep losing them, when does it change from being an ignorance that leads to inaction to a negligence? where the consequences of not being aware of this stuff actually constitutes negligence. And I'm only asking the question, as you can see by the question mark, but I am going to come back to this point because I think it's going to be something that could be quite significant in five or 10 years time. The recurring theme for canopy loss is that canopy cover and tree numbers on public land that's on our streets, parks and gardens, is relatively stable. Most local governments have policies that seek to increase their canopy cover, particularly those local councils that have been active in climate change. And despite all of this, canopy cover is falling. And the usual deal is that the canopy is lost because of the redevelopment of uh, suburban and inner suburban land. And it's not just the land on uh, the private property that goes. If you think about it, many of these big blocks um, also require the removal of nature strip trees because you've got two or three driveways or crossovers where formerly you had one. So uh, as a consequence of some of this intense development, we are losing publicly owned trees as well. Now, all of this is set against the backdrop of climate change. And you all know about this, the uh, warmer, hotter summers, the more frequent storms, the, the high fire danger, change weather patterns, um, much stronger winds. Uh, and many of these factors uh, are, are really conscious, um, are, we, people are conscious of today um, because they're now recognizing that, you know, the number of days that we have above 30, uh, and 35 are going to double. The number of days we have above 40 degrees in places like Melbourne are going to more than double in the next 30 years. Um, and for all of this, uh, we've also got issues of um, uh, localised flooding because when it does rain, it's going to rain uh, quite heavily. So we're looking at a significant change in Australian climates. Uh, for those of you who are listening to this presentation from Victoria, uh, you're probably aware of the fact that when you look at climate change affecting the Australian continent, the effects vary enormously. Uh, sometimes they're relatively minor. In the odd place, they can even be beneficial. If you happen to look at Victoria, we're going to cop a whacking. So we, we just happen to be in the right place for warmer temperatures, stronger winds, and heavier rainfall and summer rainfall when it falls. So we really are copping the short end of the climate change stick in Victoria. <laughs> now, other things that you may or may not be aware of in terms of um, trees and people's health is that during the Black Saturday fires, I think most of you would be aware that 173 people died in those fires, but a lot of Victorians and Australians are not aware that 374 people died in the heat wave that surrounded it. Um, so we've had some hot weather, but that weekend was particularly hot. The greatest number of deaths were in the western and northern suburbs of Melbourne. And those deaths correlated with the absence of trees and green space. Now, no one's suggesting that trees uh, would have saved people, but what we are saying is the correlation is very strong, so strong that the Department of Health recognised the correlation and they also recognised that they could use that correlation as a predictor. So 
after the Black Saturday weekend, areas where there was low canopy cover were identified by the Victorian Department of Health. And in areas where the demographic of the, uh, of the population uh, was of a, an older population, then warnings were given to local GPs and hospitals and ambulances that they were likely to have a, a busy time. And in areas where there weren't deaths, but had low canopy cover, um, they sought to find out why was that so? And in most cases, low canopy cover uh, and no deaths was associated with a younger demographic, in other words, new developments. So a very strong correlation, and uh, we need to learn from that. In, uh, in terms of human health, at the TreeNet Symposium in Adelaide in 2016, um, the first three speakers weren't tree people like me. Um, they were uh, from the medical profession or from um, the field of epidemiology. And one of the speakers made the observation that if Australia had more treed green space, uh, we would save about $800 million a year in terms of type two diabetes. And they also pointed out that uh, if we had more tree green space, we would save 4.2 billion uh, per annum in terms of blood pressure and heart um, related illnesses and diseases. Now, this was a, a rather nice figure for me. That was my take home message. You add them up and you've got 5 billion. And I thought I can remember that. But what really struck me was how big a sum that was, five billion every year, year after year after year. And the speakers said, oh, by the way, this is not rocket science. And what they said was, if you've got treed green space, people exercise. If they exercise, they don't put on weight. If they don't put on weight, these are the diseases that are reduced. So if you think about it, it's no wonder that the Department of Health in the states and the federal government are interested in having green and leafy suburbs. The problem with it is that nobody quite believes it. The ordinary person, the accountant, the local politician, the engineering profession can't quite believe that you can get this level of benefit at this level of uh, money from simply putting trees. And that's the problem at the moment. We, we have a gap between the, the research and the people who manage our environments. Uh, and just to put all of this into a nice nutshell, um, back in 2010, one of the Victorian Department of Health's policy office, officers, by the name of Deadman, by the way, uh, not so good for a Department of Health policy officer, uh, but a wonderful piece of work that he did. And he, he said, simply said, look, if in Victoria we could get 1% to 2% more people um, actively or passively recreating, we would save $274 million per year off the Victorian health bill. And so the question was, raised, well, how, you know, you, many of you listening will be very used to the fact that in the social sciences, changing human behavior is not easy. So one, and one to 2% set, smell, set, uh, sounds like a small number, but actually getting that change is, is not easy. So they asked Deakin University to do some work on what would encourage people who didn't exercise to exercise. And the answer came back from Deakin University, provide accessible treed green space, and particularly shade in summer. If you did that, people will exercise. Uh, 274 million, by the way, is well over double what all the councils in Victoria spend on trees in a year. So it, it, it would be a really good investment, not just for the Department of Health, but for everybody, if we could pull this all together. So now I can ask you a little more specifically. Uh, if we know of the role of trees and canopy cover in health, uh, and people do nothing about it. If state governments allow planning laws that see canopy cover reduced, if local councils uh, can't implement proper 
um, sort of development procedures that sees canopy re uh, cover reduced, then when does this become negligence? When does a person suffering type 2 diabetes say, well, look, you did nothing. You provided no green space and you're part of the cause of my problem. Now, I well understand the issue of individual responsibility here, but I also understand that there is a community health role and all of you listening, given that you're from SunSmart are, 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 or associated with it, are really interested in that community health side of things. And the same can be said for heat wave related deaths. It's a worry that in most cities and towns, if you've got a heat wave coming, you can predict where the people who are going to die or end up in hospital are going to come from simply by looking for trees on the maps. That is quite scary. And if it's that simple, then you have to ask, when does it cease to be negligence when you let trees, uh, tree removals take place against the public interest? The urban heat island effect is something that we've been known about for a long, long time. And for those of, not, that, of you that are not familiar with it, uh, the acronym UHI has even made it into the local papers, the Herald Sun and the Age. So it, it's certainly getting out there. And this is the phenomenon where cities and suburbs have so much hard infrastructure, bitumen, concrete, bricks, that they're considerably warmer, up to four or five degrees warmer than the surrounding peri-urban green space. Now, what this shows you for Melbourne is that the major impact of the urban heat island effect is on the western suburbs and the northern suburbs of Melbourne. Now, what that would normally mean in our um, state is that nothing would happen. Because if you think about it, uh, the north and west are not the high priority areas for most state governments. But the interesting thing is, UHI has captured interest. And you ask, why is it so? And the answer is, the hot air moves over the city and the eastern suburbs at night. And it's the nighttime temperature that is particularly problematic for heat wave related illnesses and deaths. Now there's an interest. The state government doesn't give $5 million to plant uh, uh, half a million trees in the western suburbs of Melbourne just three or four months ago because they think it's a nice idea and it would green up the west. That's not why they're doing it. They're doing it because they recognise that what happens in that part of Melbourne on a hot day influences most of the uh, city. So they, they really don't have much choice. They have to do something. And for those of you listening, if you think about it, five million, uh, five million for half a million trees, that's 10 bucks a tree. You'd go and try and plant a tree for $10 in a suburb or along a street. Not gonna happen unless volunteers do it. Um, what's going to happen in climate change to uh, uh, Victoria? Well, temperatures are gonna go up. They're gonna go up probably two and a half uh, degrees at least, probably closer to four if we don't do something about it. The odds of us doing something about it are looking pretty remote. Uh, given what happened uh, at the uh, Glasgow conference. So we're really looking at, uh, at an increase and that really does make the issue of urban trees more urgent than ever. I find it fascinating that uh, for a long time, as you all know, uh, the Murdoch press simply refused to believe in climate change. Um, and the first real sort of glimpse of a, a coverage was in 2017. And I'm not sure that you can read the Herald Sun headline here because it's got my little uh, UHI graphs that you've just seen. And it says, tree, tree breeze blows. And then it goes on to say, leafy suburbs keep cool in the shade, sweltering west green with envy. Now, it's a catchy headline, but you know the content, content of that article basically says, people in the west and the north are going to die. That's essentially what it says from four years ago. And what's happened since? Nothing. In the age, they've been much more consistent in at least covering climate change. And they've been talking about the frightening picture that Melbourne will face under various climate change scenarios. 
So just to give you a few insights, and I've got a number of these, and I hope we get through them all, but we may not, um, into what trees can do. My, my thesis, of course, is that when you look at a lovely parkland like this, and you can probably all recognise the shrine in the background there, um, this is not just ornamental. This is not decorative. Um, it is beautiful, no doubt about that. But it also has a really important functional role. And the sorts of questions that I'm interested in, and to some degree have the answers to, is what does the shade do? And how much value is there in that shade? And I mean economic value. Um, when it really rains, how much water is soaked up? Um, you'll notice that there are some roads in the foreground of this slide. And I would ask, well, how much um, extra life do those bitumen roads get because of the shade from the trees? And what value is that extra life? How much does it contribute? So I'm, you're putting an actual dollar value. Now, amongst all of us, I would be the first to say, I don't like putting a dollar value on trees. I think they have an intrinsic value. But in our society, if you want them recognised and truly valued, you've got to put a dollar on them. And for some of this, we can do it quite simply. So can we put a value on shade? Well, we know that shade often reduces roof temperatures by up to eight a degree. You can work that out. What does it do for your air conditioning? How much money do you save? We know that uh, trees reduce wind speeds in uh, storm events. They humidify the air, and that's particularly important for those with respiratory uh, and breathing difficulties. Uh, they remove pollutants, and we certainly got an insight into how important our urban trees were in relation to pollutants when all that smoke hit Melbourne in the summer of 2019-20 from the bushfires. They absorb water, they provide uh, uh, biodiversity, uh, they help offset your carbon emissions, all of those benefits. But there are other benefits. We know, for a, uh, example, that um, vegetation, uh, if you've got lots of green space, you have less domestic violence, you have less graffiti, uh, people are healthier, they live longer lives, uh, they don't put the same demand on the health system, they don't use as many uh, pharmaceuticals, for example. So a whole range of benefits that I could spend days talking about. Um, and I hear a collective sigh of relief because you know I'm not going to. So just to give you a couple of examples of some of the medical benefits, and some of these come from a, a metadata study that my son brought to my attention um, in the United States, which was uh, the benefits of greenness on women's health in the United States. And there were thousands and thousands of data points in that study. So just some of them. Uh, lower heat wave related deaths I've mentioned. Uh, contrary to popular belief, lower crime rates. So a lot of people feel that if you've got trees, people will hide behind them and that poses a risk of molestation. But in fact, the data, all of the data suggests the exact opposite. Uh, for women who go to hospital and for men who go to hospital, if it's a green and leafy place and they can see and interact with uh, trees and green space, they recover more quickly. Uh, you reduce social disadvantage, you live longer, and you are more resilient under stress. Uh, some for women, uh, higher baby birth weights is identified as a benefit from a, a, a green and leafy uh, environment. Uh, better learning outcomes, particularly for young kids. Uh, far fewer prescription uh, medicines used by residents. Uh, lower rates of self-harm, domestic violence, and overall higher levels of general health. Now, if there was a pill that could do all of that, everyone would be on it, no matter what it cost. And governments would put millions into it. But this is all about trees and green space, and nobody is really getting full value from it. So as it gets hotter, and we know the doubling of days above 40, uh, air conditioners are going to become increasingly important. They already are. And interestingly enough, two medium-sized trees 
eight to 10 meters tall, placed to the north or the northwest of your home, reduces the temperature inside. You don't use your air conditioner as much and it will save you about two to $300 per year. Who says so? I do. I did this work um, in, in, in uh, uh, 2013 and you might be interested to know that the ABC fact check group went and checked to find out whether I'd sort of exaggerated anything or whether there was anything sort of um, wondrous about these data. And they came back and said, no, it looks pretty good. It's a bit conservative. You're probably saving more. So that's a lot of money if you think about it, just from two medium sized trees. And as uh, uh, power prices, uh, as fuel prices go up, you actually save more. So you can actually put a dollar value on those two trees. Medium sized trees, by the way, eight to 10 meters. They're not very big. Um, this is another one that I thought uh, the SunSmart people might be really interested in. Uh, and this was work that we did immediately after Black Saturday, when a whole lot of trees were removed from school grounds. Some were removed uh, because of potential fire risk. Now, quite often, there was no fire risk. Uh, I saw trees that were removed in uh, paved courtyards. I saw trees that were removed in uh, green recreation fields that were never going to catch fire. Uh, and what we were able to do is these trees were removed and some of you may have been associated with schools where this happened. It was done in the September after Black Saturday in 2009. The state government funded the removal of the trees. The removals took place in the September, October holidays with no warning. So people didn't know the trees were about to be removed. And then later in that year, usually in October, sun came out and all of a sudden that shade was missing and the worry about kids getting sunburned was a serious concern. So what did the schools have to do? They had to put in shade sails. And we were able to work out that for a large tree uh, that might've required um, say one shade sail, that tree previously had provided $500 of value per annum each year because that's what a good shade sale costs. Some trees um, required four shade sales to replace them. So they were providing $2,000 per annum. And those trees would have continued to provide that benefit at virtually no cost to anyone for decades and in some cases, centuries. Now, I can be a little bit sarcastic here and say, it's lucky that we don't have a, a weight problem with our kids. And we know that Australian kids would much rather play under a shade sail than under the canopy of a tree. Uh, and I am being sarcastic. Um, the other thing I can point out to you is if you live on a tree lined street, um, a bitumen street, and this figure is for a street that's the, a normal suburban street, it's seven metres wide, it's half a kilometre uh, long and it has 50 trees on each side of the road. And what, what those trees do is they shade the bitumen. Now the bitumen is a super cool liquid. It has a solvent and the solvent evaporates away each year, particularly in the sun. So if you've got shade, the, the solvent doesn't evaporate so quickly, the life of the bitumen is prolonged. In other parts of the world, not as hot and as sunny as Australia, they believe that though that shade will double or triple the life of the bitumen. This study only shows the increase by half. So it goes from a, a bitumen with a life of 20 years to 30 years. So only half, and that will save you about 1.6 million in resheeting costs. Now, why would, why would I bother to do that sort of calculation? And the answer is every, every council in Australia can tell you to the cent how much damage trees have done to their curbs and their footpaths. None of them can tell you the benefits of the shade, not one. So quite often a, a nature strip tree that might be worth you know, $20,000 is removed 
because it causes $400 damage to a footpath rather than the footpath being repaired. The priorities here are sometimes quite bizarre. Uh, the carbon fixed by street trees, if you've got a, a city like Melbourne or many of its suburbs or a place like Bendigo or Ballarat, where you've got about 100,000 trees in a, in a, a city, uh, that sequesters about $30 million of carbon. So there's a lot of carbon there. But of course, many, uh, many instrumentalities, insurance companies, utilities don't want carbon to have a value. And at the present time, the value of carbon in Australia is highly debated. So I've used the $23 a tonne figure, which was the last official figure. At present time, um, the price of carbon in Europe is well over 35 euros, which is about $60 a tonne. So this figure is way, way under the, the real value of the carbon in those trees. Uh, and trees also stabilise land. So again, following Black Saturday, lots of people cut trees down on their properties and then they couldn't rebuild because by removing the trees, the land had become susceptible to a landslide or landslip. And the usual way of consolidating those sites is to use an engineering solution that costs somewhere around 50,000. Um, five trees will do the same job for virtually nothing, but you've got to wait till they're big enough to do the job. And if you remove them because you weren't thinking about after a fire, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Now, I'm guessing that some of you probably are thinking now, well, what, what trees are best? What trees can we really sort of go for? And the answer is, it doesn't really matter. Um, it depends what you want the tree to do. You can get multiple benefits. So this is just a little example of, you should be asking yourself, um, how big do I want the tree to be? How, uh, how widespread would the canopy? Um, what shape is it? Does it have a particular shape? How long do you want it to live for? What sort of foliage? Uh, is it uh, fine or is it textured? Uh, is it um, uh, uh, an evergreen or deciduous? Uh, do you want it to have flowers or do you want it not to have flowers and fruit? Because sometimes they can be a nuisance. And then you have to ask yourself, um, what sort of root system does it have? Does it spread? Is it damaging? Uh, and whether there are any targets or risk. Now, what you'll find is that most trees have something going for them. And most trees have something that you might consider to be a disadvantage. So you've got to weigh up the pros and cons. And there are real advantages to having uh, some of our native trees growing in certain places. But in some instances, the selection of native trees to do a particular job, for example, deciduous native trees, there are very few of them that will do well in Melbourne uh, and in the warmer parts of Australia. And there's likely to be even fewer under climate change. So even if you're really wedded to the idea of having um, Australian native vegetation, in some situations, if you want light in winter, for example, but shade in summer, you might be forced to consider um, an exotic of some sort, uh, or at least a tree from another state, even if it's not um, uh, an exotic from overseas. So that's just a little checklist. Um, it's quite a useful one. It's one that I use quite often, and it covers most of the important things that someone would be looking for uh, when they're considering a tree in an urban environment or in your garden. And I'm happy to come back to that if we have a QA and a at the end. A uh, couple of other things. Um, trees that are cut for power lines, uh, like this one, um, what we find is that nobody considers the, the, the services and value that the trees provide when they're pruning, and they don't even consider the amount of carbon that they're pruning off each year. Um, I can tell you from the figures that we've done, uh, if you valued carbon, even at that low price of about 30 Australian dollars a tonne, uh, most services would be undergrounded in populous parts of Australia. That is where you've got a population density high enough to warrant it almost immediately. If you don't put a value on carbon, the old above ground uh, transmission lines and communication systems are um, 
economically viable, but as soon as you put a value on carbon and you recognize the real value that vegetation has, those services would be undergrounded almost immediately. Uh, flooding, we are, people often say to me, oh, climate change can't happen because we've been flooded. But in fact, all the models for Victoria tell you that we are going to have localized flooding. It's a serious risk and one of the simplest ways. And in fact, in many parts of uh, Southeastern Australia, the only way of dealing with local climate flooding is to plant more trees. We can't put in bigger drainage systems. We are not wealthy enough to retrofit uh, retro, uh, larger drains. And what we're going to rely on is the value of trees to soak up that water and to hold that water in their canopies to prevent local flooding. So it's a really sort of uh, significant issue. And I'm also uh, reminded because of what's happened in Victoria over the last sort of year and a half, where we've had very strong winds that have blown trees over, one of the reactions is let's remove all of the trees from around houses. Well, the problem with that is if you do that, the wind speeds can double. And if you double the wind speeds, then house roofs disappear. Trees won't fall because you've taken them away. But the infrastructure that we have, um, including our uh, uh, utilities, and signage and so on simply won't cope with the greater wind speeds. So you probably would end up with, almost certainly, you'd end up with more deaths and more damage rather than less. It's, a, it's an understandable knee-jerk reaction, but a knee-jerk reaction nonetheless. So just, just um, sort of getting towards uh, the, the point here of value. In 2002, a study was done in Adelaide that said, What's the value of an Adelaide street tree to the citizens of Adelaide? How much money does it actually return? And the answer was $171. And the, the question then was, what does it cost to keep an Adelaide street tree? And the answer, somewhere between $10 and $20, depending on the council. So if you're in an outer suburb, it's only $10. If you're in the city, it's about $20 per tree. So the same study was repeated in 2009 and this PhD student said no no there's $424 per annum for each Adelaide Street tree and I know you're going to ask seven years on what does it cost and the answer was 10 to 20 dollars hadn't changed because we allocate money for keeping the trees but the benefits are real okay and it's also what happens below ground root systems and all of the things that are associated with them are really important in terms of carbon sequestration. So if you've got good trees, great um, root systems, you've got lots of fungi, lots of other organisms, and the carbon they fix is enormous. And we don't really know how valuable and how much carbon there is. We know there's a lot, but we don't really know how much. Now, I'm just going to move to a, a, the final phase of this presentation going to take about 10 or 15 minutes. I just wanted to show you the tan running track. And I just wanted to make the point, can you consider that running track? How many people would use it in Melbourne at this time of the year if those trees weren't there? Just think about how important that space is. It's shaded, so people are not getting sunburnt. Their risk of melanoma is not going up. They're exercising, so they're getting benefits in terms of type 2 diabetes and in terms of um, heart and blood pressure uh, uh, related diseases. And here is a system, if you look at this, it's a connected track, it's 3.8 kilometres, it's a soft surface for about half of it, which is great for the joints, and it's well shaded. It's illuminated early in the morning and it's illuminated until a reasonable hour at night, so you maximise the benefit. I consider this to be a well thought out piece of infrastructure, not perfect. And of course, it connects to the trails around the Yarra River. So if you want to expand from that 3.8, you do have to cross a road, but you can then go for 10, 20 Ks without very much interruption. Really important in terms of an inner city health benefit. In terms of how you view 
this tree green space, I just thought it was worth taking a few lessons from COVID over the last 18 months. And how important um, treed green space has been during our lockdowns for physical health, general well-being, mental health, coping with stressful, stressful situations, uh, coping with the increased risks of self-harm and domestic violence, the learning environments for students and the developmental potential for preschoolers. All of this came to public attention. Don't you think it's amazing that prior to COVID, those spaces were still doing all of these things, but hardly anyone talked about them. At least they've got some airing. Now, the interesting thing about this is that people flocked to the, their parks and gardens, and I won't bore you with the numbers, but just to give an example, uh, on one park that I've monitored, and so I have data and numbers on, on a Sunday during the lockdowns, there were 23 uh, times more people using that park than usual, 23 times more. But not every suburb is well served by treed green space. And in fact, in Australia and around the world, the most impoverished and disadvantaged sectors of our societies have the poorest access to treed open space. So it's well known so that if you're living in a lower socioeconomic suburb and a, um, uh, uh, a poorer suburb, you get fewer parks and fewer trees and, as, and you get poorer health, shorter lifespans and the range. So if you think about what happened in um, uh, COVID lockdowns, people who were likely to have difficulty maintaining um, uh, and complying with a lockdown order tended to come from those working class, lower socioeconomic um, sectors of cities. And people would say, well, why should they do that? And the answer is because they have the access to the green space that you and I might have in some of the other suburbs. There is a real social disadvantage here and it happens across Melbourne. It happens across Sydney. It happens in Adelaide. It happens in most of the cities of the world. This is well recognised and there's been lots of research done on it. Excuse in me, other part Greg, sorry, Greg, could I just um, ask a question regarding that? So obviously there's a, a disconnect between where all the trees are. So yes. say, for example, some of our um, audience are working in local government areas or schools or early childhood services that don't have those green spaces. So have you got any recommendations on how to access, you know, those spaces in an affordable way? Is that something yes. to help with in the... And, and, and look, your question has just come before the, the, the last dot point. What um, a beautiful segue. What a segue. In, in other parts of the world, um, they recognise this and they tree streets. They provide private landowners with trees that conform with their planning policies. They make school, sure that their schools are green and they try and connect some of these suburbs with um, nature strip trees or median strip trees so that they can get to the green spaces. The interesting thing about this is as soon as you start putting trees into a suburb, you start to get the benefits. You don't have to wait until they're mature which is really amazing. And this applies to even things like improving the quality of the air. Small trees will make a difference. But what they also find is the real estate value of those suburbs goes up. As the real estate value goes up, the uh, properties become more valuable, the areas become gentrified, and people then tend to be pushed to areas that haven't been treed. So you have to keep on the move. So yes, there are solutions to this. And the usual solution is from local government to take um, control of the trees on their streets, but also to recognise that it's in a community's interest to give people plants to plant, particularly when they can't afford them. Uh, some cities, by the way, also have programs at certain times of the year where their street trees will have a tag on them and if you go up to that tag, it will look like a price tag, 
but it'll actually tell you how much money that tree is worth in that year in terms of providing shade, purifying air, improving health. And the figures always amount to hundreds or thousands of dollars per annum, always. So we want this tree to open space. And just to start sort of wrapping up, um, treed open space meets the physical, mental and psych psychological needs of human beings. Uh, some of these needs go back to the uh, 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 impact that, that locomotion has on human evolution. So to give an example, uh, navigating through a large, uh, diverse, connected green space engages the senses of sight, hearing, smell, possibly taste and touch all at once. And this activates the part of the brain that deals with problem solving skills. It might even involve memory. Uh, and, and because if you've been there before. Now, all of this is multitasking par excellence, uh, but requires large biologically uh, complex space. And it's really important for human development uh, from infant to adult. Uh, so these activities uh, we know work walking. Uh, working through, dealing with these spaces, stimulate the brain's uh, many, uh, many uh, dopamine secreting neurons, and they impact on motivation, attention spans, and persistence, all of which are really important. Now, just to, to wrap up, uh, most of our lockdowns have come in the colder months and in autumn. But what happens if they happen to occur during summer? Didn't happen much last summer. What happens if we're locked down during this summer? Um, how important is the, sh the, the, the trees and the shade then? Uh, and is there sufficient in our parks, reserves, and along our straight, uh, streets? Uh, because if there's not, the price might be greater risk of skin cancer and melanoma, um, reduced recreational activity, people saying we're not going to go out, with all of the increased um, associated health risks. So, what this reveals is we really have to look at this in terms of cost benefit. And we've got to look at all of the real costs and all of the benefits. Public open space did brilliantly during COVID and is still doing brilliantly during COVID. And you know, it can do the same in terms of climate change. The benefits are enormous, but those benefits won't be there if we keep losing one to one and a half percent canopy cover every year. The other thing that will probably happen, just by way of my uh, role as prophet of the future, um, almost certainly economic times will be tough in 2022 and 2023. I can almost hear it now. We'll reduce the parks and gardens expenditure for local governments because that's not important. And you can imagine the impact that what that will have in the long run. So I'm going to leave it there because I think that's probably a good space. I put in a few extra slides if you want to use them, but I'm not going to talk to them. I'm going to stop my uh, screen sharing now, and I'm happy to take questions from anyone who might want to ask them. Thank you so much, Greg. Can I start off by um, just asking, say imagine I'm an early childhood educator or a primary school teacher, and I see my outdoor space for learning and play, and it's quite, and it's concreted over, there's walls everywhere, very little green. What's my starting point? How do I know where to get the trees from, where to plant the trees, how to maintain the trees? How do I get this on the agenda for everybody? Okay, well, the first thing is that there's loads and loads of study uh, on the value of uh, trees and vegetation for the development of young kids. And there was a wonderful uh, presentation at TreeNet a couple of years ago uh, by people who were constructing. Uh, playgrounds and they address this very matter that you've raised. Um, so all of the papers on the TreeNet website, and I I do have a connection with TreeNet, it's not financial, um, I'm on their organising committee, all of those papers are available and all of the podcasts are available free and without any passwords, so you can just go and get them. So simple things would be suggested. If you've got concrete and no one wants to remove it, get some plants in tubs, just trees that are too to three metres tall, cost about $120 each, and they make a difference. Secondly, 
put some dead wood, a big trunk, a big branch. There was some, there's some beautiful data on a playground, some very, very sophisticated playgrounds uh, where a lot of money was spent. And in one of them, a tree fell down and they left it there. And they filmed what the kids did. And they, uh, they were able to, to, to see from the compaction of the ground where most of the foot traffic was. And the most popular item in that playground was the fallen tree. None of the expensive gear. And, and I can tell you, I have, I have six grandkids. And during the lockdown, I would take two of the boys to a fallen tree and that saved them in their sanity and mine. Um, that tree was a castle, a pirate ship, a racing car. At one stage, my six-year-old grandson was the captain of the pirate ship and the three-year-old was the cook. And the cook got highly offended because his meals weren't up to the standard that the captain was after. So you can do simple stuff like that will make a huge difference. But look, there, there, there are lots of people that will give you advice on vegetation. Um, there's plenty of uh, really good information on the uh, internet, as I said. Uh, TreeNet's one of a, a very good one. But if you go on there, you'll find loads and lots of it is easy, quick and cheap. Okay, fantastic. And we've had a comment where one of the local government areas who do a, a tree planting day each year weren't able to do it during COVID. So instead forwarded the, the plants to our kinders to share with their families. So that was a, a nice way to help green the area. Yeah, look, many, many local governments are really quite terrific. And I know it's, it's the Australian tradition to bag governments, but local governments do a lot of great work. Many of them run uh, tree planting schemes, particularly along linear parks, along um, creeks and rivers and the like. And many of them will aid schools if they want to plant. Uh, many of them have a, a really good plant list for a local area. So you asked me before what trees, uh, go to your local government. Not all of them are great, but many of them are really, really good plant lists. And quite often, they will have some of those trees in, um, in stock, uh, perhaps more than they are going to use, or they may have an order that's coming and they've ordered three or four extras. And they're usually quite generous to local community groups and schools. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, has anybody got any particular questions that they'd like to unmute and ask? something specific to your situation or setting. So I know, um, for example, you know, some people may be reluctant to get, you know, green spaces on the agenda because it does require a little bit more effort and people are concerned about, you know, seed pods, attracting bees, you know, berries, choking hazards, it becomes messy. I mean, you've obviously just spent the talk telling us about the benefits but how do we um, tackle the naysayers? Look, the, the disadvantages are really quite fascinating. I, I occasionally get emails from people who um, really tear strips off me for being irresponsible. Uh, so, for example, one of the classics would be, how can you talk about such and such a tree? Um, it's fruits are poisonous. And they are. I, I, I've often said they're fruits are poisonous. But... The truth of the matter is there are virtually no reports of kids being poisoned by those fruits or other flower parts or other uh, tree parts because they taste bloody awful and kids are not stupid, you know, so they're not going to sort of, most of them anyway, not going to stuff a whole lot of stuff that tastes absolutely frightful. Now, of course, there are some trees that do pose a risk uh, and for example, and they're not, they're not all trees. Some of them are uh, shrubs. The oleander, for example, shouldn't be anywhere near a kindergarten or a school. Um, uh, and so there are some other trees that can cause allergies in kids and the like. So you, you do have to think about that. But I think one of the things that people forget is that you, you have to do what I said earlier. You, you really have to do a, uh, a proper risk analysis. And 
uh, if the if the uh, dangers to kids are high, then you do have a restricted palette of trees. There's no question of that. Uh, in relation to um, uh, tripping hazards and the like, which is also uh, an issue, particularly if you've got grandparents, for example, uh, bringing kids to a kinder. Um, one of the um, uh, trees that I, I'm quite fond of is uh, Melia azadarac, uh, the white cedar. Now, some of your uh, group here, some of the people listening to me at this moment will be going, that has fruits that are like ball bearings. And they are, they're really, really hard. And if you've got lots of fruits, then they will represent a genuine risk, not just to kids, but to uh, adults, particularly older adults. So what can you do about it? Well, one, you can use a broom and sweep up. Not gonna happen in lots of places. So you'd be pleased to know that there's now uh, a variety of that tree available and readily available through the nursery industry that will flower, but doesn't set seed, doesn't produce fruit. So you can have the tree and not the risk. So um, I, I noticed that uh, some of your, uh, the group here would be saying, well, we're highly regulated. Uh, we've got a very high level uh, in terms of our duty of care and you have uh, as a person working with tree management. Um, I tell my students that when you're dealing uh, with um, young children, your duty of care is almost absolute. It's not act totally absolute, but almost. And you do have to think these things through, but you've also got to ask yourself, well, if we decide we won't have any trees, um, what are the risks to the uh, kids in other ways? Um, what are the risks of them getting sunburned? What are the risks of them not being able to um, follow a normal uh, path of development? And this is where uh, I think we have to really um, think about our society and our connection with nature. Um, one of my papers, which I, I, I don't often talk to, was about the connectivity of, of open space, how important it is that um, people can have access to open space that lets them do the things they need to do. And sometimes you need 20 kilometres of open space and sometimes you need two and a half kilometres. And when I was researching that paper, the thing that becomes really apparent is kids who develop in connection with complicated um, biological open space develop a whole lot of skills that help them to develop as adults and to be resilient and resourceful in later life. Um, we human beings, whether we like it or not, have evolved with trees and vegetation as part of our environment. And if we think we can have normal, uh, healthy and long lives without some relationship to that environment, we're kidding ourselves. So it is that important. And for many of our politicians, uh, decision makers, accountants and the like, they find it very difficult to believe that something as simple as green space is that important. But I'll, I'll give you a, a simple example. The Children's Hospital, the new Children's Hospital in Melbourne, you all know has a garden, a children's garden. And it's not on the ground floor. I, I can't remember which floor it's on. It's on the fourth or the seventh or something. And it wasn't cheap. And people would ask, how could they afford to do that? And the answer was, they couldn't afford not to. The data that shows that for kids in hospital, for adults in hospital, if you have access to plants, you recover more quickly. You don't have uh, as many infections and as complications. And your ultimate outcome is superior if you're in, in contact with plants. If you can't actually contact them, but can see them, you get those benefits, but not to the same degree. If you can't see them and you can't touch them, if you have a picture of them, you get some of the benefits. Now, this is not research from tree people like me who could be accused of gilding the lily in favor of trees. This is from the medical research. 
So we are connected to the ecosystems of the world, whether we like it or not. And the simple truth of the matter is people like yourselves who have all these constraints placed on them um, in terms of children's health and well-being, ultimately, if you don't provide them with some of this green space, you're also going to cop it. That's the nature of our society. Yeah. So can I um, sort of take us back to some basics? If I really want to get started, but I'm not a green thumb, I want to get like a tree, I want to go down to Bunnings, spend some of my money to get a tree to stick in my school or early childhood. Is there some kind of really simple rule or um, top tip advice that I could get about where I should plant that, that it's potentially going to have some kind of hope of living? Okay. What sorts of things am I looking out for? Look, almost any tree will fill that bill. Um, so uh, my normal uh, sense is that for most um, uh, sites that are away from a building and where light in winter might be important, you can probably go for an evergreen. There are lots of exotic and native evergreens that will do the job. Uh, and uh, most soils will allow uh, a tree to grow well. Uh, keep the tree, you know, somewhere between four and five metres away from the building to minimise any sort of uh, root problems. And then the recipe of success is add water, but make sure you've mulched. So mulch is absolutely crucial, I think, to sustaining a tree, particularly if it's going to ultimately be in a low maintenance environment. So most trees, when you plant them, they're going to need some irrigation for the first two summers. They may need an occasional irrigation thereafter. Um, and irrigating in the first two summers might mean that you irrigate them once a week, um, uh, maybe 20 litres of water, something like that, depending on the size of the tree. But if you've got mulch, and when you mulch, you use an organic mulch, that just means plant material that's mulched up, and you have the mulch that's to a depth of uh, 75 to 100 millimetres. And you have it at least to the extent of the root ball and half a metre beyond. So if your root ball is a metre across, you've got two metres of mulch. If you have the luxury of an irrigation system, my advice is leaky pipe or drippers under the mulch. The leaky pipe of today is a completely different product that some of you might have known and cursed over um, 15 or 20 years ago. It's much, much better. It doesn't block up as rapidly. Uh, and by putting the uh, pipe or the drippers under the mulch, you maximise the benefits uh, of the water that you supply. Um, in some instances, uh, just this is just by way of an example, uh, you might want to consider a citrus tree because it's evergreen. Uh, pick one of the varieties that, don't, that doesn't have the, 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 uh, the spines on it um, or the thorns, uh, and just a normal lemon tree will do it, um, and you get the benefits of the fruit. And if you think about some of the great courtyards of, say, Spain, um, they have citrus trees that are being grown not just as uh, fruit production trees, but as uh, ornamentals. Um, some of our own lily pillies are a terrific tree, an evergreen. And of course, the uh, if you've got a connection with the local indigenous people, they'll be able to tell you what to do with the, um, with the fruits. Uh, and some of the varieties that are available today, when they're in flower, are breathtaking. Um, will they attract bees? Yes, uh, some of the trees uh, and some of our native trees and even trees such as the, um, the river red gum, which would be uh, suited to a number of the uh, uh, areas that are represented by people in this group, or even something like the, um, the spotted gum, which is uh, sort of widely planted, they will attract bees when they're flowering and that it'll attract so many bees that you'll think the thing is going to take off. You can hear the tree humming um, and you might be worried about people being stung 
and so you should be. But if these once these trees get up to sort of five uh, to ten meters, then most of the bees are, are only interested in getting the pollen and returning, and the risk of being bitten is very very low indeed. Brilliant. Thank you. That's great top tips. Okay, now I realise that we're a little over time, so some people need to get away. But um, has anybody got any last questions before we finish the webinar for this evening? I think we've got so much to arm ourselves with, you know, the benefits of trees to get a group together, to get some funding, to get some planting and to get green because the, the health benefits, the emotional benefits, the intellectual benefits are just so important. And I'll be happy to help. I mean, I, I'm regularly sort of available. My email is known to far and wide. So um, anytime I can help, and I think you've done well. I think you've got about 60 people to this uh, webinar. I think you did very well indeed. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to say a huge thank you to you. Um, it's been amazing. I'd like to thank everybody for attending. It was wonderful to have you join us. We will make sure that we put this on the website, the SunSmart website, and um, send you some links to, to um, things that Greg's spoken about. So thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful summer. Stay SunSmart. Slip, slop, slap, seek, and slide, and uh, stay in that shade. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you.